The practice of electing a patron saint as a personal or group intercessor is unique to the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches. But even among members of our own faith, the concept of patron saints is often misunderstood. The selection of a saint to serve as our personal or group patron is like asking a particularly spiritual friend to help us and to pray for us. This does not mean that we cannot approach God ourselves. It only means that with the patronage of one of Christ's elect, we do not need to bear our burden alone. How the custom of electing patron saints came about and their position in Catholicism is one of the most fascinating and little known mysteries of the church. Hello, I'm Carolyn Morrison and welcome to Mysteries of the Church. I think to talk about patron saints, you really have to know what saints are. Sanctity is really an element of how well we come close to our God who created us and who calls us to himself. The saints are the people who have succeeded in doing that. I, I think what the saints are, going back to that basic understanding, men and women who followed Christ, who lived a holy life. And they inspire us. They encourage us, and as we look to their lives, as we read their stories, as we read their writings, um, they're meant to bring us closer to God. Um, and if someone says, well, I prefer this saint as opposed to that saint, you're, you're free to choose. Among all the saints who have been canonized, some become regarded as particular patron saints for certain uh, places or persons or needs or occasions. A patron is someone who does good for you. It comes from the Latin word for father, pater. It's a variation of that. But a patron saint also can be someone who, for a particular individual, um, they ask them to intercede for them. You know, the saints don't do anything for us, they intercede. Jesus, and Jesus who is God, is the one that performs the miracles. But the saints intercede like a friend. And this person has been chosen as a particular intercession before God for either a person, a place, a community, or an organization. I think the saint who best captures what it means to be a patron saint is once again more of a modern saint, and that's Saint Therese, who lived in the latter part of the 19th century. She said in her, in her writings, I desire to spend my heaven doing good on earth. I think that could be the banner for what it means to be a patron saint. In the earliest church, it was a time of persecution. There were many martyrs, and the very first people to be venerated as saints were those who were martyred, and frequently they were venerated at the place where they were martyred, or sometimes at the place where their remains were interred. So naturally, when they consecrated a church to public worship, or the, what they would have called a temple for worship, they would have consecrated to the memory of one of these martyrs, and they would call on that martyr for his or her intercession on behalf of the community. The clearest example is St. Peter and St. Paul, both in Rome. And you had pilgrims going to these sites to, to venerate, to be in the presence of the remains. And so the churches became associated with particular saints. At its earliest beginnings of electing patron saints in the Catholic Church, especially since the period where Christianity was permissible to be, to be lived and to be believed in public, it was associated with a location, with a place that kind of captured and was able to maintain the memory of a martyr. People sometimes, in, particularly in the United States, you know, we look in Brooklyn, many of the churches are named after the patron saints of the various immigrant groups. You know, they came from their town, from a particular town in Italy or Ireland or from Peru or Mexico. There wouldn't be um, a formal process of an election of a, of a patron saint. 
Um, it could be very simple in that a community or a person elects a patron saint or chooses a patron saint. But the church does not have a formal process by which that is, that is um, established. Through the course of the centuries, when someone was baptized, they took, what often we say, a Christian name, meaning named after one of the saints more often than not. You know, if someone's even a profession or someone lives in a particular nation, and they say, well, this saint is my saint, they're free to choose. So the saints really are our extended family in heaven. And so in a simplistic form, that's really what the patron saints are. Now that we understand what it means to be a patron saint and how the practice of electing patron saints came about, in the next segment, we will answer the question of how particular saints became connected with particular needs and situations. Mysteries of the Church will be right back. When the first churches elected to commemorate their favorite saint by naming their new place of worship in the saint's honor, they could not have suspected the far-reaching effect these first patron saints would have on society at large. Over the centuries, countless social and business groups, professions, individuals, and even entire nations have looked to the patronage of a favorite saint to help them during both good and bad times. As we shall see, there is quite literally a patron saint for every need. We get always in our prayer directed directly to, uh, to Christ. But it is helpful when we intentionally consecrate, and we intentionally name and put before us an example of a saint that likewise served in this profession or strove for holiness in this ministry and that we recognize them, place them before us and then try to likewise live that profession exercise that ministry in the way the saint did. When you look to the saints and people may say, well, how did so-and-so become associated with this profession? Um, there's really two answers. The first answer is some of the more ancient um, associations developed um, organically, but it was people, you know, that were in that profession and said, you know, this saint really inspires us. You know, clearly St. Peter being originally a fisherman, is an inspiration to fishers. If they've done that particular thing in their life, they become identified with it. Probably the most invoked saint, in my opinion, for the things of this nature is St. Anthony, who is the patron of lost articles. St. Anthony was a, uh, a Portuguese priest who was one of the earlier members of the Franciscans. He was known as a terrific orator and preacher. He converted souls. And he's associated with lost objects because he helped to recover so many lost souls back to the faith. There are different reasons or opinions about why this devotion continued to grow and to spread and why St. Jude was elected as the patron saint of helpless causes or desperate situations. So Jude became a true apostle that after the resurrection of Christ, he preached the gospel. He speaks about Christians and encouraging Christians because now they're living in desperate situations. They see their fellow Christians dying and being murdered. He encouraged them to persevere in their faith regardless of the circumstances they find themselves in. There's a very strong tradition that St. Luke, the evangelist, also was a physician. So he has been considered a patron saint of physicians for many years. Saint Apollonia, who was one of the uh, ancient Christian virgin martyrs, uh, part of her torture of martyrdom involved, uh, involved all kinds of disfigurement, including pulling out a lot of her teeth. So she's a patron of people with toothaches. In some sense, uh, saints, you know, you can look at big scale or small scale, you know, a person may have an individual patron saint. A person's parish may be dedicated to a particular saint. Um, a person's profession, you know, there's the patron saint of this profession. You know, saint Thomas More for, for politicians. Um, and then you have the, the notion that nations or countries 
um, have a particular patron saint, someone uh, to be their intercessor. In terms of patron saints for countries, it seems to me they fall into three categories. It's either where a particular saint was born, or it's where a particular saint lived and worked, or in some cases it's where a particular saint died. Okay, so Saint Joan of Arc, of course, was a young French woman. So the French identified with her, even more so for the fact that she helped to liberate their country from the English. Saint Patrick actually wasn't Irish, that's pretty much agreed upon, but he devoted his life, his work, his effort, and his impact uh, in faith to the people of Ireland in a massive way. So we see that all throughout the world, that a given country would elect a patron saint who was the one to first preach the gospel, to first bring the saving message of Christ to that country. We have different reasons why different countries uh, would identify with a particular saint. Somebody like Saint Bartholomew the Apostle, he's regarded as a patron of Armenia. He wasn't Armenian, but he was probably martyred in Armenia according to very strong tradition. One of the great uh, patron saints of Europe is Saint Benedict. That's one of the reasons our Holy Father chose um, when he right after his election said one of the reasons he picked the name Benedict. Saint Benedict was the patron of Europe or is the patron of Europe. If I was to highlight a female patron saint to really bring forth the understanding of the church and the understanding of, of the Christian community of the importance of female saints, it would have to be Catherine of Siena who was truly one of the great saints in the life of the church. You think of all the great Italian saints from the early church to present day, it's Catherine of Siena who is the patron saint of Italy, one of the great Catholic countries which possesses so many of the remains of the early church and of the martyrs. But you could just go down the list of so many of them. Uh, the ancient virgin martyrs are in a class by themselves. Be Cecilia, uh, Barbara, uh, all of them uh, were highly, highly uh, venerated th uh, through most of the history of the church. In more modern times, you had people like the various St. Teresa's, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Lourdes, Mother Teresa in our own time. Uh, all of them remarkable, strong women uh, with tremendous faith uh, who are invoked for, as the patron saints of of various types of uh, uh, causes and needs. So quite often we see male saints and female saints. We shouldn't think, well, there's more male saints or there's more female saints or there's a, there some sort of competition. I think we're un unique in the United States where we celebrate many different saints. We celebrate Italian saints, we celebrate French saints, we celebrate German saints, Irish saints, we celebrate Spanish saints, we celebrate Mexican saints. We celebrate the lives of men and women throughout the world. They inspire us, and so um, you could have a, a patron saint who's a female saint or a male saint. It's not like, oh, you're, you're boxed in. The saints are people who live the holy life and who inspire us if we look to their lives to follow Christ. So if there's a female patron saint that I would focus on, it would be St. Catherine, to show that whether you're a male or female or whatever state you find yourself in life, that you could bring about great good in living a life of holiness for the church. I think in a certain sense, the church discovered feminism long before uh, secular American culture did because uh, you had women like St. Catherine of Siena giving very definite instructions to the Pope uh, back at the time of the Avignon ca captivity. Uh, you had St. Teresa of Avila reforming uh, convents uh, full of religious, including religious men, uh, throughout uh, Spain and Europe in her lifetime in the post-Reformation. For centuries, both male and female patron saints have been helping ordinary people and entire nations cope with the stress and turmoil of everyday life by carrying our prayers to God. In the next segment, we will look at some very special patron saints whose holy lives have been incorporated into some of our most popular public holidays. Mysteries of the Church will be right back.
It is sometimes easy to forget just how connected the patron saints are to our everyday lives. Even when we are looking forward to our favorite holiday, it is well to remember just how many of our largely secular celebrations are actually intended to honor the lives and works of truly outstanding men of God. So how did shamrocks, heart-shaped greeting cards, and brightly wrapped gifts for children evolve out of religious holidays originally meant to honor the memory of some of the most beloved patron saints in Christian history? So even though a particular community or a person or a church or an organization has claimed or nominated or elected a saint as their patron saint for a given reason, that doesn't mean that others can't call upon that saint for a different reason. Obviously, St. Patrick would be an example of that. Even though Patrick is the patron saint of Ireland, that doesn't negate the possibility of him becoming a patron saint or a saint that is dear and near to another community. St. Patrick is the patron of Ireland, um, but also the patron of Nigeria. I, I found this out a few years back where a priest of Nigeria told me that St. Patrick was the patron of Nigeria. And listening to him, it made sense. The great missionaries that came from Ireland went to Nigeria, and of course they brought St. Patrick. People often like to think that St. Patrick is Irish, and we, and we claim that. But Patrick himself was from the British Isles. He was from what would be today Wales. He was a Christian in the latter part of the fourth century. Well, what happened to Patrick was that he was taken into slavery, that he was taken into prison and brought to Ireland. And he spent many years in Ireland as a prisoner. Upon his release, he returned to England, what we would now call England, to the British Isles, and became a priest and ultimately a bishop. And in his prayer, he felt the call of the Irish people, who were still pagans. And so St. Patrick returns to the land that in, in, in capt, in enslaved him, we could say, um, to share the message of Christ. And so in a unique way, St. Patrick brought the faith of Christ to the men and women of Ireland. Um, and during his lifetime, we see a dramatic conversion, um, a dramatic change where the church really begins to blossom in Ireland. Nobody loves St. Valentine's Day more than Hallmark and those who own restaurants. Um, but we see that the holiday or marking on our calendar February 14th has taken on a different meaning in recent years. Our records, the, the historical documents we have, indicate probably four or five different St. Valentines. In other words, a number of saints who happen to have that name, uh, most of whom did live in the first few centuries of the church, most of whom actually were martyrs. But St. Valentine was a real-life person, and it was a saint. St. Valentine lived in the latter part of the third century, and he was the Bishop of Rome. And as we know, during that period, the Christian faith was still persecuted. They were not allowed to publicly worship God or to profess their faith in Jesus Christ. At that period, at the end of the third century, the emperor of the time decreed that his soldiers, those who were serving in the Roman army, could not wed. So Valentine, in secret, in private, began to witness the marriage of soldiers to their sweethearts. Valentine was eventually imprisoned. He was given the opportunity to be released if he did not profess his faith in Jesus Christ. And at the end, he said, from your Valentine. It probably has to do with uh, what St. Paul said uh, so often in his letters, the love of Christ impels me. And that concept of love for God translates into love for neighbor, and including the ability to have uh, romantic love that is a fully Christianized love. Nicholas is another example of a saint from the earlier life of the church whose devotion grows at a later period, which is a bit mysterious, is a bit puzzling. Saint Nicholas, of course, refers to Saint Nicholas of Myra. Myra is a city in Asia Minor, which is a modern day Turkey. Uh, he lived in the sixth century or so. He's a figure who is closely associated, uh, documented with his pastoral ministry as a bishop, his tremendous generosity to the poor, 
and his ability to work miracles. So this is the fourth century. And we see only in the Middle Ages that a greater devotional awareness of St. Nicholas grows. There was maybe we could say a tale told about Nicholas who came to the aid of young children. It was during a difficult time where a man kidnapped children and killed them. The tale tells us that upon Nicholas's knowledge of this situation, he comes to their aid and brings the children back to life. So the tradition grew that on his feast day, on December 6th, because of his love for children, because he gave to these children, that the tradition grew of giving gifts to children on December 6th. In close proximity to Christmas, but not on Christmas. St. Valentine, St. Patrick, and St. Nicholas all play an important part in helping us remember the true meaning of their particular holidays. But what about the patron saints that help us through our everyday lives? And what if we have a job in a newly created profession? Do we also have a special patron? In the next segment, we will look at those saints who represented jobs which no longer exist, and those who watch over new jobs created by our modern world. The fact that all things change is a reality even among the saints. Many once revered patron saints have been largely forgotten because the causes they represent no longer exist. But those seeking a sanctified helpmate and intercessor in times of stress need not worry. There are always new patron saints ready to intercede on our behalf in this new and ever-changing world in which we live. When we look to patron saints, people may say, well, what happened to those professions that no longer exist? And now we have new professions, people that work with the internet or um, various forms of technology. Um, I, I think we would, there's a danger to say, well, look, they've been demoted. Their field doesn't exist anymore. But what the saints do, or patron saints of professions, um, come and go as professions come and grow. But just because a profession no longer exists or has somewhat gone by the wayside, we, we should never feel that, well, now the saint's been demoted. No, the saint is with God. I think one saint that we could highlight that would fall into this category of saints that have kind of fallen by the wayside would be St. Christopher. As we know, St. Christopher, many people even today are named St. Christopher, and his devotion was far and wide. But the church no longer claims St. Christopher, we could say, because we can't ascertain the real truth of his actual existence. So that doesn't mean that communities can't call upon the memory of St. Christopher, because ultimately when we call upon a saint, we are calling upon the power of God anyway. But saints like St. Christopher would no longer be promoted by the church. As we know, many the, the world is evolving. We have ministries and we have occupations which were not present even 50 years ago. So the church does find a way for the faithful to be able to see in saints a way of living that ministry or that occupational profession even today. Nowadays when a new profession comes up, um, people start saying, well, how come we don't have a patron saint? And so there's a little bit more collaboration, there's a little bit more discussion, um, say uh, on the universal level in terms of the Vatican and, and others, that says, well, the, this person seems to be uh, a noble character, someone that can be um, an inspiration, someone that can inspire those in this field. I think it's only to be expected that uh, uh, new patron saints will emerge. For example, uh, sometimes we can, we can retrofit a saint. The classic example of that would be St. Clair. On her sickbed, when she could no longer uh, get to church, it is said that she had mystical visions of the Mass being celebrated elsewhere in her convent. And uh, so she was designated at some point in the 20th century as the patron saint of television because she was the first one to have wireless uh, 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 vision uh, communication, I guess you could say. The obvious example is the internet, which is now kind of controls the world. We live and die by the internet, which was not present 20 years ago in the way we now know it. So the church has named, declared, elected 
a saint as the patron saint of the internet. That patron saint is Isidore of Seville. Isidore was dedicated to study, to writing, he wrote dictionaries and encyclopedias. And this is what he's remembered for. So Isidore was a natural saint to turn to, to consecrate this world to, this new world and this profession. And not that you have to have that patron saint, but as I said, they are men and women who can inspire us. If you, whatever profession we're in, they all draw us to Christ. Christ is the center. Christ is um, what the focus is. The saints are men and women who lived a holy life, but keeping Christ as the center. Patron saints have interceded for us in times of need, danger, and stress. The exemplary lives of these holy men and women serve as an example of how problems can be overcome through belief in God and the power of prayer. Whether our problems are big or small, asking our special patron saint to help us by interceding on our behalf can help bring both comfort and resolution to life's most complicated situations. Thank you for joining us. I'm Carolyn Morrison, and I hope to see you next time on Mysteries of the Church.